and you're an absolute brute. But you don't do weights, do you? No, I don't do weights. I don't do weights. If I'm sorry, how do you not do weights? I'm telling you, because the day I do weights. Can I just? Can I? I'm not being weird. Can yeah, I just okay. touch him? You can. You can. Right. Okay. What's up, guys? Derek, my place, Today we're going to be talking about Adama Trower. Trower? I should have looked this up beforehand. Adama. Trower and um, apparently he claims he doesn't even lift weights, but he still looks unreal. I'm gonna fact check this actually in a sec, but just the people that have sent me this, everyone's tagging me and saying, oh, this guy, um, he's just yoked as fuck, but he doesn't even, not only does he claim natty, but he claims he doesn't even lift, <laughs> doesn't even lift weights. So we're gonna get into this. Is this achievable naturally or not? Adama Traora has uh, a lot of people wondering, is he on gear? Like, this guy does not look like a traditional soccer player. In fact, he almost looks like a sauced rugby player playing soccer. It's kind of an uh, odd thing to see this guy on the field against these soccer players looking just like a house beside these uh, skinny little boys, basically. At least relative to his physique is what I mean. So the first thing I wanted to see is his statistics, because, you know, it's one thing to see a guy who looks jacked, but if he's you know, five foot six or something, then it's a lot more realistic to expect a guy to look compact and pack on muscle tissue fairly easily, at least, or distribute it across his physique where he looks more jacked proportionally just because he is shorter. Like some guys who are, you know, five, six or under, they can look way more jacked even when they're natural. So when I was looking up his statistics, I found some really conflicting evidence. So one thread said, can't believe he only weighs 72 kilograms. Exactly my question. At 5'10 with that physique, he should be at least 205. He's on roids, dot, dot, dot. So um, dug a bit further. More threads. This guy looks absolutely insane. Adama Traore at Wolves FC. He looks natty, but at 160 at 5'10, that's an insane body and hard to maintain. So some people think he's 5'10 at 160 with this body, which to me seems absolutely absurd. Don't forget, the dude's job has him doing cardio almost every day of the week while training. Very fucking hard to maintain. While Who Scored also claimed that he's 160, I think he looks way heavier. Now, given the numbers, he'd have a BMI of 23, which is totally normal for a soccer player and can even be up to 25. I think he's probably at 170 and a little and just has naturally good-looking muscles. How does he look so big at 160, though? No fucking way he's 160. I'm 5'10 at 162 and fairly slim. Attainable natty with great genetics. 23 i thought he was mid 30s I don't think you can get this big and lean natty don't think your muscles can get this filled look how full his biceps are again he also claims he doesn't lift weights which we're going to get into later so this is what he looks like current like his physique looks like objectively i would say this looks like 185 not at least not fucking no chance 160 let alone 170 is definitely pushing it too if this guy was like five foot six then maybe i might say okay 160 to 170 makes sense but even that that would be pushing it in my opinion so this guy's supposedly five foot ten and as i dug further i found some different statistics on some different sites so if you google it you'll find 1.78 meters and 72 kilograms which is you're putting him at like barely 160 Actually, 72 kilograms is only 158.73 pounds, which is what Google seems to think he weighs. They think he is 158 pounds, which is absolutely fucking absurd considering what this guy looks like. Remember, this is what this guy looks like. So I kept digging because I thought that made absolutely no sense. And I found this site, soccerbase.com. It says he's 5 foot 10 and his weight is 75.74 kilograms. So even this was actually the highest one I could find the 75.74 kilograms, at least for a site that is supposed to be a an official source of statistics. And when you actually plug it in, so 75.74 kilograms is 166 round up 167. So 167 pounds at 5 foot 10. Again, the taller it is, the more unrealistic it seems that he weighs this little like look at this. Look at this guy's physique. Does this look like 158 to 167? No, it doesn't look anything close to that unless this guy was 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 7 at most. So, if this guy's 5 foot 10, I don't see him weighing any less than 180 to 185 unless his bones are made of fucking air. So, that was a bit of a red flag to me. I don't know why the statistics are so off or if this guy is just constructed with the most 
fucking strange bones of all time where they're pretty much hollow and there is no uh, weight to, I don't know, maybe his muscles are just like hyper inflated and he has the best muscle inserts of all time. And he weighs basically nothing. And he's like the next Flex Wheeler. I don't know. But even just looking at him, even, you know, guys who look bigger than they weigh, like Flex Wheeler with the round muscle bellies, they still weigh a decent amount to pack on size. They still have a reasonably high weight on the scale that looks at least somewhat proportional to what you perceive them to weigh. And this guy just defies all logic. Like he's fucking shoved full of helium or something. So the next thing is looking at what this guy used to look like back when he started. So he started with Barcelona in 2012, and this is what he looks like in 2019. So he went from a skinny kid, basically, to having a 3D Death Star delt, a meaty-ass trap, a barn door lat, and a horseshoe try and a half. This guy is... uh, Literally looks like that sprinter from uh, Brazil. What's that guy's name? Um, used to sprint the 4x100 with Usain Bolt. That uh, Johan Blake. Johan Blake was the guy's name. This guy, they kind of look similar to me. To be honest, this Ad- Adama Traora is even more jacked than fucking Johan Blake, who is one of the top 100-meter sprinters in the world with a body designed... <laughs> literally for the most anaerobic process you could possibly do like this is the pinnacle of physiques in sport is 100 meter sprinters guys who are designed for max effort explosive fast twitch muscle fiber action going from one spot to another in under 10 seconds so the most jacked athletes in the world adama treore playing an endurance-based sport. Despite his position, it's still an endurance-based sport. So this guy literally is walking around looking like a rugby player who also could be a world-class 100-meter sprinter (laughs) with the same level of leanness and muscle mass as guys who are top Olympians in the 100-meter class. So, you know, his physique is unrealistic compared to other soccer players just obviously he's a genetic specimen and a half but just keep in mind that this guy's physique does not reflect the training methodologies used to optimize soccer performance so the guy has gained absurd amount of muscle over his career too it's not like he always looked like this if you look at his before and after 2012 pretty damn skinny all of a sudden he looks like johan blake plus another couple pounds of muscle and somehow he only weighs like 160 to 165. So going back to the start of his career with Barcelona, this is what his physique looks like. So he's a lot skinnier, obviously, but you have to take into account this guy already had a great physique at baseline. He had visible abs. He's got the fucking serratus sliced in. He's got the sex lines going. He's got the razor sharp pelvis. This guy is just diced as a natural, essentially, way back in the day. This guy is uh, had literally just started his rookie year, and he looks better than guys in their 20s when this kid is like 16 years old. So obviously, he's a genetic phenom, but anyone could point that out. The thing that's notable about this, though, too, remember, he said he doesn't even work out with weights. So, and something he said during that interview is something that I found uh, really noteworthy that I wanted to bring up here about his hypertrophic response to weight training and why he stopped doing it specifically. And you're an absolute brute. But you don't do weights, do you? No, I don't do weights. I don't do weights. If... I'm sorry, how do you not do weights? I'm telling you, because the day I do weights... <laughs> can I just... Can I, I'm not being weird. Can yeah, I just okay. touch him? You can, you can. Right. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, that's not weird, dude. Not weird at all. I can't. How do you not do weights? <laughs> I don't do weights, but I haven't got I do, a Popeye I do exercise, I do exercise with, with uh, upper body, for sure I do exercise, but no no weights because uh, I'm go- I build quick, too quick. So this guy gets jacked too quick, so that's why he doesn't do weights. But anyways, let's let him finish here. I remember um, when I started doing some, uh, some weights when I was uh, 16. Right. I come back in the preseason and the manager said, we have a new player here. Who are you? What happened, Salama? What you been doing in the summer? I said, I don't know. I've been doing some exercise because I have, I did have pain in my knee yeah. and, and I did some exercise upper body as well. So he tell me, you have to come down. You have to be. So this guy, he claims that his 
hypertrophy response to weight training was so over the top significant that at 16 years old, his coach told him he was getting too jacked and he needed to calm down and size down. So remember, this is what he looked like at age 16 in 2012 compared to what he looks like current in 2019. And in 2012, this is him being too big and needing to size down. So it's pretty evident that he's weighing at least 20 pounds more than he was in 2012. He is shredded in both of them. And in 2019, he's clearly holding at least 15 to 20 pounds more lean tissue, in my opinion. So some of his statements about not training with weights are a bit misleading, though, because this guy does actually use, uh, does like pull-ups. He does, you know, uses a medicine ball. He uses ankle weights. He uses cables, which is like resistance. Um, he uses bands, he uses calf raises with uh, like clearly a weighted machine. Like if you actually look at this guy's training regimen, it's very misleading to say I don't train with weights because he makes it seem like he doesn't do any resistance training, but he does stuff that is conducive to, I guess, the explosive movements in soccer and whatnot. And a lot of it is, you know, body weight intensive and whatnot and not really traditional compound movements with barbells and stuff, but... He still does get under things that cause resistance and result in him having to, you know, would get a hypertrophy response from it. Like this calf raise machine, there's obviously some sort of load that he's trying to lift here, similar to what you would be doing with weight training. So to say that you don't weight train at all is a bit misleading. He makes it sound like he just walks on a soccer field and kicks a ball around all day and somehow grew 20 pounds of muscle, which... Is not the case, but anyways, that is uh, of note, of course, because his physique has transformed significantly since day one. Like this is him back at age 16 in 2012 for Barcelona as that 16 year old who apparently was growing way too quick and was uh, way too big and needed to downsize. This is what he looked like at that point. So <laughs> keep that in mind as the baseline that we're kind of referencing here. This is when the hypertrophy response was too much when he looked like this. And then a year later, this is what he looked like playing for Barcelona and again. Not much bigger, despite this supposedly being the peak year in which he gained way too much muscle way too quickly. So obviously he was working off of a fairly, like he was still jacked, but I mean a much skinnier baseline and progress isn't overnight, but there is not a massive difference between this physique and the year before when supposedly his hypertrophy was going off the chart above and beyond what was uh, conducive to soccer and he had to reel things back and change his training methodology to not get oversized too quickly, which obviously did not fucking work because he ended up gaining 20 pounds plus of muscle after this point when he claims he pulled things back. Like in 2013, he's still nowhere near what he is now. Like here, he looks like a soccer player. I would guess this guy actually plays soccer in this video clip. However... When I see him in 2019, this guy literally looks like a meaty ass rugby player that is on a soccer field playing against soccer players. This literally looks like Johan Blake polymerization with a fucking rugby player. So maybe it's conducive to his position to be uh, this explosive and this uh, powerful and whatnot. And the amount of muscle definitely helps, I guess, um, or else he wouldn't have gained it. But, you know, to claim there was no resistance training with weights, it's kind of a uh, a misleading statement, obviously. So he did definitely do some things with resistance training that is of note. But again, the physique transformation is substantial, and it seems like it occurred in a fairly short time frame, like 2012 to 2013. He looks pretty similar. 2014 looks pretty similar. Going to 2016, he's a bit beefier, but he's still not where he is now. In 2016, he's maybe up, you know, seven pounds of muscle since uh, the start of his career. And then by the end of it, he's like full rugby player mode. Now, the time frame itself isn't naturally achievable. Yeah, like on paper, if you actually look at the pounds of lean tissue he's put on since the start of his career to the end, you know, you could easily argue that that's naturally achievable for the vast majority of people even. Like he'd maybe gain, you know, 25 pounds lean at the most throughout the duration of his career, which has been almost a decade. Like he's been in the sport now for eight years. And I guess seven with the time frame that we're actually looking at with some of this footage until 2019. But the vast majority of the progress was gained at a pretty substantial rate 
about halfway through through his career, he kind of exploded. And again, though, it's hard to say for certain about one thing or the other because when he started, he was 16. So you could claim, well, he's just not even fully grown. So how could you expect him to gain the progress he did at age, you know, 20 when he like when he was 16? So I'm just going off of what he's saying though too. And he said his hypertrophy was way too exaggerated when he was 16, despite the fact that he's gained the majority of his muscle mass. It seems like at a later age, around 20. 21. So that is of note, of course, as we move forward through this. Like, this is what his physique looks like now. Um, this guy is uh, could easily step on a men's physique stage if he wanted to. And uh, if he wanted to dedicate his life to bodybuilding, I think he'd be pretty damn successful. His muscle bellies are just absolutely insane. And he doesn't look like his weight at all, if that even is his weight. To me, it doesn't even look close to what his weight actually is. I think his weight's probably more in the ballpark of 185. Now, looking at this article, Ada, Adama Traore's incredible body transformation revealed from scrawny kid to hulking hench wolves winger. Adama Traore has terrorized defenders this Premier League season by packing a punch with his new bulked up physique. Go onto the Wolves wingers Wikipedia page and you're greeted with a photo of a skinny, lanky, somewhat awkward looking teenager in 2012 when he supposedly was packing on the most muscle possible in way too exaggerated of a manner and had to pull things way back because he was getting too jacked too quick compared to 2019 where he's not even training with weights and somehow he's way fucking bigger than 2012. So he has undergone a radical body transformation in the span in the space of seven years. And realistically, it was more like the space of three to four years. And in that space, supposedly he's doing less to gain muscle than he was back in 2012 when he was actually attempting to. So way back in uh, at age 16, 17, this is what he looks like. And then now here he is <laughs> looking like a cranked out of his tree rugby player beside a soccer player who probably shouldn't even be on the same field. Like this looks like two different sports competing in the same thing. So digging into this guy's background a bit more, I wanted to see how strict the testing policies really were in this league because soccer isn't really a sport you would traditionally think guys are going to abuse gear for or any kind of performance enhancing drugs. So I want to see how lax it is compared to something like the UFC, compared to the Olympics, um, compared to stuff like that. And if you haven't seen my video on the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio, the carbon isotope ratio testing, basic screening and parameters for Olympics, as well as uh, UFC testing. I recommend you watch some of those videos. A good one to start out with, I think, is the Justin Gatlin video, if you haven't seen that. I highly recommend you watch that as I kind of dig into the uh, basic screening parameters and how guys are circumventing them. And that is going to relate specifically to this situation with Adama, because it's not like soccer players haven't been busted before. And these guys you know, predictably, most of them don't even look like they take gear. This guy, Dinamo, Zagreb, or I don't know this fucking guy's name, tested positive for steroid UEFA confirms. He was banned a lot. This is an old article, by the way. Not a lot of soccer players seem to test positive, but of the ones that do, notably, they don't necessarily look like they're cranked out of their mind. This guy was banned last week for failing test after a win over Arsenal. This is four years old, by the way. Um, UEFA has confirmed the Dynamo Zagreb midfielder Arijan Ademi was banned after testing positive for the anabolic steroids to nozzle. So does this guy look like he's on some sort of gear? Like not really. Does he look like a hundred meter sprinter Johan Blake? Does he look like a rugby player? Does he look like anything like a Dama? No, he doesn't. This just further solidifies the fact that most guys in sports that are taking something, they don't necessarily look like the traditional quote unquote steroid user and everyone who's looking for signs of steroid use oftentimes they're completely overlooking the fact that these guys gear isn't that insane if you're not training for hypertrophy and even if you are most guys at your gym that use gear and train for hypertrophy still look like shit to be honest that's just the nature of the beast and genetic response but in soccer in particular these guys are trying to get very specific performance outcomes that aren't necessarily cosmetic related so when you're looking for jacked out of their mind physiques you're not going to see it in most of the guys that are using gear with adama though this guy not only is the pinnacle of his sport for performance but he's gained an absurd amount of muscle tissue above and beyond what the average soccer player would look like and he is a genetic specimen that doesn't even look like he should be in the sport like look at these delts look at this fucking meaty physique look at the ab cuts protruding out here this guy literally could stand on a men's physique stage if he wanted to 
His ego is so big, yet so fragile, he feels the need to convince people he looks better than 95% of people who lift without ever touching a barbell. <laughs> like, some of the comments are so funny about this guy. 95%. Like, this guy looks better than... I don't even understand these percentages when people say, oh, that's like top 1%. It's like, dude, do you think 5% of people who lift look anywhere near this guy? I don't even know one person at my gym who looks like this guy. Like, this guy looks insane. This guy is better than 99.99999% of people. In soccer especially, this guy blows everyone out of the water. So this guy is top 0.001% genetics, not 95%. He's not, you know, worse than 5% of people. It's fucking ridiculous. This isn't even an argument. Football players are tested monthly, even at halftime during some games. All football players are natural. Well, they drug test a lot in soccer with harsh punishment, so I don't didn't know if he'd risk it. Are you fucking kidding me? They are not even WADA compliant. It would be incredibly easy for all but the thickest player to take PEDs and get away with it. They only test post-match or at the training ground, so a player could take an anabolic with a nine-hour half-life such as Oxandrolone, which is Anavar, by the way, and piss clean easily. He was also a Barca youth player, and it's not like they have the best reputation when it comes to doping in football. So this is something I wanted to dig into is UEFA's doping controls and how strict they really are relative to other leagues and whatnot. So... In the guide, they kind of outline what kind of testing they do. And basically, they make it sound like they do random testing at any time. They collect blood and urine samples. Um, you might be tested at the match. You might be tested at training or even at home. They test for steroids, EPO, GH, stimulants, etc. Basically, the whole laundry list of compounds you see on WADA's banned substance list. And they will do it at any time. And it's super random. When I looked at the UEFA site... You know, they try to present themselves as this uh, professional organization that does all this uh, testing to maintain a high level of sport that is super clean and blah, blah, blah. As I dug further, you know, obviously guys have been popped in soccer. They're more few and far between, but it does happen. I wanted to see how prevalent the testing really is. Like how often does it happen when they do it? Are they proactively doing something like carbon isotope ratio testing or are they simply doing a basic testosterone to epi testosterone ratio screen with synthetic metabolite testing to screen for things that are easy to pick up that aren't bioidentical in this article by uh, heath chesters this is pretty old but uefa anti-doping call in on real madrid training session the fact that these articles are so few and far between too i think just further solidifies the fact that the testing is actually pretty fucking lax from what I can tell. 10 Real Madrid stars were obliged to give blood and urine samples as part of the UEFA anti-doping visit. Uh, among the players who were reportedly selected uh, to give blood and urine samples following the Thursday training session were blah, 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 blah. I can't say all these names. Um, they were paid a visit to the Valdebabas, Valdebab, I don't know how to fucking say that either, training base of Real Madrid on Thursday, performing mandatory tests as part of their ongoing battle against the ongoing battle against doping in football. So a visit from UEFA's anti-doping control unit isn't so uncommon, despite the sensationalism headlined by such visits among the various outlets of the Spanish media, although they seem to take great offense that any of their leading clubs or star footballers would even contemplate any form of cheating to enhance their performances. So, but going down further, in fairness, the visits Real Madrid have had to endure aren't actually all that frequent, with just three made over a period of nine months. However, players of all clubs competing in European competitions are more frequently required at random to give blood or urine samples after participating in matches. Any player participating in a UEFA competition, this is stated by UEFA, by the way, may be required not only to undergo a doping control after a match, but also to undergo out-of-competition controls. Uh, and then they outline what they do. So when you actually dig into this, though, it doesn't seem like these tests are that frequent. And even when they are, despite them being quote-unquote random, they seem to only occur at matches or at training. So even if you are using something, if you plan the pharmacokinetic profiles of whatever hormones or compounds you're leveraging, it's not unreasonable to think that you just plan around your training and your competitions and ensure everything's cleared your system in time because you know that these quote unquote random tests are actually occurring at the matches almost every single time. So despite them getting tested at random, if you know what's going to happen during a match, you know the time frames you need to clear these compounds by. So even if it's random, you might have been saucing for the entire time up to a competition or up to an event. 
And then you just make sure it's cleared in time. And after the event, even if you get randomly tested, you just go back on after the event is done because it seems like there's no at-home random testing really occurring. It seems like it's few and far between even at the matches themselves. And the step-by-step -step guide that basically outlines how they do doping control basically elaborates on how you know any player may be selected to the players chosen in the selection draw this includes players who are replaced blah, blah blah teams are notified of which players will be tested 15 minutes before the end of the match during the doping control a player may have to provide urine blood both blood and urine um blah 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 at the end of the match when leaving the pitch the selected players will be notified that they have to undergo a doping control the team doctor will usually do this but sometimes it will be the dco or an official chaperone the players must sign the notification section blah 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 again it seems like this is all happening at matches and it's pretty you know while random on the surface it seems like it's pretty planned in that if you just understood how to circumvent basic screening parameters that you could fairly easy leverage certain compounds to get a significant performance outcome that would otherwise go undetected and probably even if you were to get carbon isotope ratio testing at the time since you know that it's probably only going to happen at the matches or at training you just ensure this stuff is cleared in time and then you never have to undergo any problems because you don't have these guys randomly showing up at your door so again this guy he's obviously a genetic freak even if he's on gear or he's not on gear He's a freak. Like, this is what he looked like when he first started. This guy is Jack. Moving forward, though, you know, in the middle of his career, all of a sudden he seems to start packing out a bit more size and he kind of explodes and then turns into this cranked house who somehow has a uh, helium in his arms and weighs 158 but looks like he's 190 shredded like here he literally looks like a giant fucking house rugby player sprinter Johan Blake ass truck stick. Like, there's no, <laughs> there's just no way. The transformation isn't like couldn't be written off as 100% natural, in my opinion, to the point where I'm not going to look at this very seriously. And the fact that the doping control seems a lot more lax really makes me question this. Like, honestly, if I was in this guy's position and what I think he may have done, if he is enhanced, which I think the likelihood is higher than not that he is. Not because the amount of pounds he's gained isn't achievable necessarily. And again, on paper, I don't know what he's actually gained because these weight statistics are so off with what we're finding online. But let's just say he gained, I don't know, 20 to 25 pounds in a span of probably three to four years of lean weight. Sure, if you were completely untrained, I suppose that is achievable naturally, all but difficult. But this guy's a genetic specimen, so he could probably do it if anyone can do it. Again, though, he was weight training since 16. And from 16 to 17, the amount of progress he gained is not really reflected in the progress he made from you know, like 20 to 24. And again, as far as why would somebody, you know, who plays soccer even take gear? Why would they take performance enhancing compounds? Any kind of synthetic that could be picked up on metabolite assessments in urine and whatnot. You know, I would argue he probably leveraged something like a bioidentical testosterone. Like for me, that would make the most sense because not only is it something that achieves muscle protein synthesis and basic, you know, hypertrophy related effects through traditional mechanisms like AR activation or, you know, aromatization, 5-alpha reduction, you get these psychoactive effects on the brain through the 5-alpha reduction of DHT as well, resulting in better uh, neuromuscular efficiency, better, uh, tr stronger training, more aggression, more... Uh, mind muscle connection i guess for uh having sharper reaction time having more on point fine motor skills stuff that would relate to a um soccer player more significantly and in addition to that the stimulation of erythropoietin can't be understated through these androgens the increase in aerobic performance is something that it would certainly help significantly for a guy playing this sport who is the size he is getting that epo boost is definitely going to help him not gas out as quick especially with the amount of muscle he has on his frame eating up oxygen so of all the choices like when you look at the anabolic steroid family tree you have uh the testosterone column testosterone is the main bioidentical compound hormone that you endogenously produce and is something that isn't necessarily picked up easily via a basic screen because this is something that would otherwise be tripped on a testosterone to epi testosterone ratio rather than something picked up in the urine as a synthetic because this is something you would need to further delve into via carbon isotope ratio testing to actually determine is this 
synthetic in origin or endogenously produced. So if you are using, you know, a dose of 250 to 300 milligrams, as well as understanding when your actual tests are occurring, because you know they're likely going to be occurring during matches only, it's not that hard to leverage something that you can, uh, like a short ester test that you can clear out of your system quickly and ensure that you're going to fall within that T to epi T ratio should you be screened. And of the choices, like not only because it's bioidentical does it make tons of sense, but just from a sheer performance outcome aspect as well, you know, testosterone is characterized mainly by its broad spectrum effects on anabolic and androgenic dependent functions, like I said, and it has a strong influence on a red blood cell count, energy systems, and basically it's like a hybrid of behaviors in the body analogous to how endogenous steroidogenesis would otherwise regulate balanced activity. So, you know, it's anabolic, but it's not completely tissue selective to the point where it's just pure protein expression, like something like a primable. And in general, it facilitates more of like a middle ground of effects. You get some muscle growth, you get a significant amount of neurological effects, you also get the enhancement of aerobic mechanisms. It's just an all around, you know, like well-rounded compound for a soccer player. Obviously he is somebody who has to be powerful and strong. And that is obviously what he's uh, become renowned for now as a right winger. But in addition to that, being able to leverage the neurological effects and the enhancement of endurance is something that is obviously welcome for any soccer players running up and down the field consistently and is not just doing 100 meter burst sprint like, uh, you know, Johan Blake. So, like, to me, this is the no-brainer compound for a soccer player that is trying to skirt the testing. Not only do you have quite a bit of leeway when it comes to the testosterone to epitestosterone ratio, which is likely the, you know, first line of defense, so to speak, when they're actually testing you, but understanding when the tests are occurring and being able to proactively clear at least a significant enough amount of the compound to fall within that cutoff you know, you can use upwards of, even if the test was immediately thereafter, you can get upwards of, you know, 200 to 300 milligrams of test in your system and not trip the uh, IOC cutoff, which is notable and sort of reinforces the likelihood, in my opinion, that it's kind of difficult to believe that one of the most jacked guys, if not the most jacked guy in this entire sport with the best performance and the most significant accrual of muscle tissue despite not like actually going out of his way to say that he doesn't weight train whatsoever, even though he does do some resistance training, it's clearly not progressive overload with compound movements or something optimized to gain as much muscle as possible. And yet as a indirect byproduct of doing random calisthenics and weird little, uh, you know, cable movements, he's as a byproduct packed on 20 plus pounds of lean tissue over the past few years, the likelihood that that was naturally achieved you know, I guess you you could still argue the genetic anomaly debate, but I think just the fact that the lax testing, the very uh, obvious lack of consistency, as well as the predictability of when it's going to occur, like it's not like there's a database where you can see how many times these guys were tested. Like with the UFC, we can see Yoel Romero was tested 17 times in 2018. It's not like Adama Traora has some database we can see how many times he was tested. So obviously I could be wrong on this, but it seems like it's pretty damn lax and there's not a lot of guys popping hot for stuff. And there's quite a bit of wiggle room, it seems like, not only for preparing to get around the tests, but in addition to that, the level of screening just seems subpar in contrast to some other sports. So for me, despite you know this guy being a genetic specimen and a half and it you know you could argue it's natural just based on the fact that you could really drag out his muscle building timeline to seven years if you really wanted to uh you know argue the other way to me it looks more like a you know like four-year condensed time frame of indirectly somehow gaining 20 pounds of contractile tissue and significantly enhancing his performance at the same time with pretty lax uh testing parameters and um, very basic screening parameters too that could be circumvented with relative ease, at least by understanding pharmacokinetic profiles and understanding which compounds to leverage to uh, maximize your performance relative to what kind of uh, loopholes the tests afford you and just leveraging them and taking advantage of the opportunity. This guy is one of the top athletes in the sport evidently, or at least that's what it's perceived to be by the amount of requests I've had to cover him. 
and he's one of the fastest guys in the sport. He's clearly the most jacked. He doesn't even look like he belongs in the sport. And if this guy isn't on gear with this lax of testing, then who is? And there's guys that look like Dynamo, Zagreb's, Arjana Demi popping for Stenozolol. So if this guy's popping for Stenozolol, what's the likelihood that Adama Traore in the same league with the same lax testing is not doing something as simple as a bioidentical testosterone and falling within the basic parameters that can be circumvented? I think it's pretty likely that at least at some point he leveraged something like a testosterone or um, obviously, there could be another compound of choice, but I think the thing that makes the most sense in terms of performance outcomes that would be desirable for a soccer player in his position, as well as uh, getting around the uh, testing parameters, would be something like a fast-acting testosterone. So let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Do you think Adam... I keep saying fucking Adam. It's Adama. At least I think so. How to pronounce his name. Adama Traore is natural or not. And if he wasn't natural in your opinion or isn't natural where where do you think the red flag was um where do you think things kind of uh picked up and he started blasting or just getting on whatever it is that you think he got on what do you think the red flag is what do you think he's taking if he's natural why um i'd love to hear anything you guys have to say all the comments help the algorithm so it's much appreciated when you guys drop them down there like subscribe check out anything i'm associated with video description below if you want to get high quality patient care via a TRT clinic that actually understands hormone optimization and how to maximize your quality of life, performance, and health, I recommend you reach out to my TRT clinic, Evolve. They are in the video description below. All you gotta do is drop them a message and the patient care coordinators will get in touch with you and can go over any kind of uh, hormone optimization practice that you may feel you benefit from, address your hormones, and your blood work in general from A to Z, check out any imbalances or deficiencies you may have, and then forward your information to one of our doctors who will then uh, design a protocol just for you over Skype, FaceTime, Zoom. It's all telemedicine from the comfort of your own home. You don't even need to leave the house. And then your medications get shipped to you right to your door. Um, you can save $50 off your first order with the coupon code MPMD50. Um, if you want to support Gorilla Mind, Gorilla Mode, Gorilla Mind is my turnkey nootropics designed for cognitive enhancement. It's what I used to stay focused and locked in for 14 to 16 hour work days on a regular basis. And honestly, they help a significant amount. The level of creativity and high quality work I get out of these products is uh, honestly unmatched by other nootropics in this, in, in this niche. This is before I even made these products. I used to mix raw powders myself because there's nothing that really uh, fit the bill for what I needed in this industry. And I feel like they excel and do a great job at what they're supposed to do. So I recommend you check that out if you are interested in productivity enhancement in general, just high quality work, cramming for exams, business presentations, late nights, uh, editing, whatever it is, these are the products that excel for that. And then pre-workout self-explanatory, what those are, just check your current pre, go pull it out right now, pull out the label, look at it, compare it to Gorilla Mode. This is our hybrid pre-workout with uh, all of the NO precursors, plasma expanders, intracellular hyperhydrating agents, as well as a potent cognitive enhancing blend for focus and uh, mood elevation and whatnot pre-workout and getting uh, in the right mindset to go crank out the weights. Then we have Gorilla Mode Nitric, which is the stimulant-free product if you work out at nighttime or you just want an even more high level of performance with no stimulants whatsoever. Um, some people don't like the stimulants or stimulant averse, or they just don't like them or they train at nighttime, whatever it is. Gorilla mode nitric is completely maxed out with the highest efficacious dosages of all of these ingredients you will find in one product. There's tons of products on the market that claim clinical dose, but in reality, they're just hitting the minimum clinical dose to be considered efficacious. What we do that sets us apart is we pick the maximum dose that yields the maximum outcome where one more gram would not yield any additional benefit. So that's where our product set us apart. And then Gorilla Mode Stim is the stimulant only product that actually just got released recently. It is just the cognitive enhancing component of Gorilla Mode Classic without any of the performance enhancers for the NO precursors, um, hyperhydrating agents, etc. Because some people just want a either an energy formula to sip on or just the cognitive blend to take pre-workout to get in the zone. They don't need all that other stuff. They don't want the creatine. They don't want the glycerol. They don't want the L-citrulline, the nitrosogene, the agmatine sulfate. They don't want any of that stuff. They just want to get focused, locked in, get a good workout and get that mind-muscle connection going. 
And um, this product is a more cost-effective price point for that because it doesn't contain all the other ingredients. So there's something for uh, every goal in terms of a pre-workout. And if you are interested in getting the highest quality pre-workout on the market, I recommend you check that out. Our feedback has been exceptional and the labels speak for themselves just compared to whatever you're using. And it's uh, pretty transparent in my opinion. Anything else I'm associated with, video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.